All right, YouTube, I talked briefly on my Blood Moon live stream, uh, which, by the way, we're still here and it's October. I wonder why. Could it be that the Blood Moon had nothing to do with the end times? Oh, <laughs> it seems so. Um, I wanted to talk about the rebirth of Baal, um, some of these sort of, the concept generally, when you really think about it, within the occult, of the Egregore, the Servitor, um, some people talk about tulpas, which I don't get into that X-tier nonsense. It's really just a meme at this point. Uh, wanted to talk about the concept of thought forms, the concept of using the will collectively or individually to cause an effect upon the world, because that's really what magic is. Magic is the manipulation of the spiritual plane or of mundane physical phenomena by means that are unquantifiable or not yet quantified by what you would consider mundane, mainstream, secular science or observation. What, m what many people would consider strange phenomena. You, th you would think back to something like alchemy. Some of the processes described in alchemy are little more than medicinal herbalism or, or what we would now call rudimentary chemistry. But it's still classed with the occult. Why? It's classed with the occult because the first group of people to speak about such things, um, they claimed that it had a divine source and they knew how it worked and, and they were right in some cases, they understood some of these physical processes. But at what at the time would have been considered secular science, and in many cases into the early age of modern science, people thought it was nonsense. Uh, they did not believe that any of the things spoken of by alchemists were actually possible. We now know, of course, many of them are. Some of it is medicinal, um, plants with medicinal compounds that at the time, um, it would have been considered witchery, it was sorcery, it was the occult, it was the mystic philosophy. It wasn't classed with science. Um, early science continued this tradition. It, it really isn't until sort of the Scandinavian tradition within some of the early science, uh, looking at, in many cases, at spiritual phenomena and really deriving scientific conclusions. So you look at uh, Haxon or some of these works, um, the Scandinavian scientists comprehended that there were, explain, there were explanations for medieval renaissance and even earlier phenomena that were classed as spiritual with science. You could classify, well, why are these people claiming that they can fly? Well, it's because they're dosed on Datra or Henbane or something. Oh, well, that's an explanation. Uh, why did they consider this plant to cure a headache? Oh, well, aspirin. Something like that. Uh, th there's a mundane e explanation for it, but the mundane explanation was not known back then, yet the effect itself was known. That's part and parcel of the occult. Um, the concept of transmutation within alchemy, of course, you can't transmute minerals together. Uh, by boiling them and, and putting herbs in them and, and chanting over them. That's true, but you can in a particle accelerator. It is possible. Until the last few decades, of course, science said there is no way. It is absolutely physically impossible to transmute elements. We now know that's not entirely the case. You can't do it easily, but you can do it. Now, with enough effort or, or a strong enough radiation source can also accomplish the same thing. Not at profit. Not at a capitalist profit. Not in a in a time-effective manner, so that part modern science remains true on. The concept of the thought form is quite simple. It's simply psychological energy. I return to this topic again um, after some time of not speaking about it. The concept of these deities being unleashed upon the world, or these demons, however you wish to class them, being unleashed upon specific groups of people, uh, you can think of it as simply a, a lingering energy, sort of the theoretical physics aspect, or you can think of it as divine retribution, sort of the more antiquated aspect. It doesn't really matter how you regard it. When we observe that such is the case, it appears to be true. There is an attempt right now um, on the internet, and previous attempts appear to have worked, uh, to sort of uh, restore the sort of paganistic elements that are present in early antiquated Middle Eastern lore, Baal and some of these other, you know, Nungal, Humbaba, or Nurgle or something, uh, to restore these sort of pagan energies to the point where they can have an effect. Uh, you can look at this one of two ways within secularity. Either the collective thought form is influencing reality and causing some sort of an effect, possible. Uh, there is evidence to suggest that that can actually happen. 
The other possibility is you would expect the people that are sort of the target, specifically in the Middle East, ISIS, Islamic rebels in general, um, will see that this activity is going on beca because they're superstitious, they will begin to worry about it and then they will make mistakes. Either way, it doesn't matter, it achieves the same effect. Or again, you can forego the secular, say this deity in some form or manner actually exists, whether we're talking about a, a detached sort of cosmic energy or an intelligent being, and then upon veneration, upon recognition of this being, it gains power capabilities and is capable of moving in the world. I would say um, any of these explanations are just fine, it doesn't matter, but there is an attempt right now to revive the worship of Baal. Now Baal is sort of one of these misunderstood figures within paganism and the occult. Many people just assume it's sort of this cow-headed demon uh, to which people routinely sacrifice children. There's no evidence to suggest that that sort of sacrifice was frequent most of those speaking of such things come from after the worship of this being was rare, if, if even still extant. Um, they come from latter-day sources, specifically Jewish and Christian sources. What do we know about the Jews and the Christians? Typically, when they encountered some sort of foreign deity, it transformed them into a demon, put them into their own sort of pantheon of, of lesser beings subjugated to their lord, um, classed them as evil, classed the people who worshipped them as evil, because although they were monotheistic in their practice, they believed in one specific male Abrahamic deity, they were also henotheistic. They believed that those other divine forces existed. They didn't disbelieve in them. They didn't do what the Christians do now and say, well, Zeus never existed, has no power. Uh, Baal doesn't exist. Astroth's not real. Um, guy, All of these different the pagan deities, they never existed, they don't exist, they never will exist, there's no power in them. That's, that's a Protestant practice. The Catholics early on and the Jews before them and sort of the Nazarites and all of these different groups, they all believed that these other deities in some form existed. They simply didn't worship them. They didn't venerate them. They considered them maybe subjugated to some other part of their own pantheon to sort of declare hegemony over the spiritual forces of one of these neighboring groups, but they never disbelieved in them. They simply subjugated them, or they said that they were evil and then fought against them. That's what the henotheists did. That's what the Jews did. That's what the early Christians did. Only later on with, with the Protestant religion do you get sort of the renunciation of the idea of this extremely elaborate paganized pantheon of deities. Look at Dante's work. Where do the virtuous pagans go? Do they go to hell? No, they're not in hell. They're being ruled over by this sort of paganistic figure of King Minos, living in a city of light, living in a, um, under very comfortable circumstances, actually. They're not being punished or tormented. The only thing that they've suffered as a detriment is they're not with God. They happen to be um, the light of humanity is their guidance rather than the light of the one true deity and his various angels and archangels and cherubim and seraphim and so forth. That's the only detriment that they suffer. This is sort of the Catholic answer to the modern Protestant uh, sort of material. And so the rebirth of these pagan forces or beings or figures or whatever you wish to call them is an active project of some of these occultists. There's a rebirth in Hellenism right now. There are people that venerate Zeus and Aphrodite and all of these other figures right now. There are people that are, are now members of various Roman cults. They worship uh, essentially the same beings under different names, and Jupiter and so forth. Um, there are people who worship Odin. They don't do it ironically. They're not doing it as, uh, as you know, something just to do. They don't do it as a form of entertainment. They see it as part of their culture. They feel it gives them power. They're right. Um, they are beginning to rebuild these temples. Um, they're doing that because it's a source of not just uh, physical enjoyment, but spiritual enjoyment, power, um, cultural edification, cultural identity. And this is going to continue becoming more prevalent as the Western cultures especially and to a lesser degree the Eastern cultures break down over time due to the evil of multiculturalism. People are going to more and more seek these sort of folkish traditions. It's happened before. It happened in the early 1900s. Folkishness increased in Europe because there was social alienation. People went back to their roots. You, you would say some of the uh, things that people did back then were not very nice. Uh, many of them were not nationalistic. 
when you know Hitler went off into North Africa and places like that, that's not nationalism. Those were never German areas. That was imperialism, which was tolerated up until then. Nobody had a problem with imperialism until Hitler did it, which is very funny. Um, the Russians invade their neighbors up. Oh, nobody cared, even if they're commies. That was imperialism, not nationalism. Nationalism is Germany and Austria form one state because they have the same culture. Imperialism is they then uh, attack Poland for no reason and uh, declare Lebensraum, two totally different concepts. Um, because Hitler was uh, dumb in fighting a war on multiple fronts. He was. Uh, a lot of people venerate him. I'm not exactly sure why since he lost <laughs> and <laughs> crushed the German race for decades, allowing communists to grab up a third of his country's land area after they lost. Hmm, not exactly sure why. Uh, but anyway, back to the principle of paganism. Yes, um, there, are, there are ongoing attempts to do this. Ebola Chan was essentially a crude form of egregore. Um, tens of thousands of people got Ebola and died. It was, the death count probably is two or three times the total that's listed. Many of these corpses weren't recovered because the people just sort of dumped them in a shallow grave. They wanted the remains to be there so that they could practice what is essentially a form of ancestral worship. When you cremate these corpses, there's no remains to venerate. Uh, deeply culturally disturbing to the people of West Africa. I don't blame them. Um, it did keep the pestilence going, but at the same time, they would rather have the grave uh, and, and join their departed one uh, loved ones side by side in the grave than to forego that and sort of lose that chain of ancestry. Um, you've got to understand the, the cultural impacts of something like that. When foreigners show up and say you have to burn your relatives' bodies when you have a fairly strict cultural prohibition against doing so. That's going to be a fucking problem. They should have known better. They should have found some other way to cordon off the bodies other than cremating them. They, the international community was partially responsible for the problem in the increase in Ebola cases because they refused to take care of the bodies without fully immolating them. It was partially their fault. That's one thing that I would claim. Winter Chan is the next attempt. It's still ongoing, and you do. Right now, um, oddly enough, Europe is bracing for what could be the worst winter there in, you know, 50 or 100 years. So it does get a little, it gets a little bit into the too spooky for me stuff. That's very much true, oddly here in the Northeast. Right now, we're 10 degrees above normal. I feel just fine. Uh, you go bother the Europeans. We want a nice mild winter, you know. We don't have a problem with uh, you know, a million refugees practicing Islam in our country at the moment. So leave us alone. Go, go play around in Europe and you know, soak them in icicle cum or something like that. So yeah, some thoughts on you know the general concept of thought forms, egregore, and so forth. And egregore, basically, you've created this thought form and it's gained partial sentience as opposed to a servitor, which is not really sentient, maybe to a limited degree. There are multiple terms that are sort of used here. Uh, you could even say that all cosmic beings, as they're referred to by the occult and by religions, uh, really are different classes of this same concept. You'd have to believe so. If you believe that it's the thought form creating the sort of divine energy or occult capability, you might as well extend that to deities and demons and things like that. It makes no sense to simply relegate it to your own actions and then say, oh, but those rituals are special because I'm communicating with a truly outside pre-existent entity. How do you know that? Um, if you're claiming that about the former, you may as well claim it about the latter. And if not, you may as well claim, if, if the demons and the deities and all those forces are real, you may as well just claim, yeah, I'm doing literal magic here. It's not about a thought form. I'm tapping into the occult current. I'm tapping into the sinister current. You should regard it as one, if you want to be a purist, regard it as one way or the other. You're sort of mixing your terms up when you speak about these two things. You're sort of mixing the post-Crowley age or Blavatskyan style of thinking, the sort of semi-modern to modern material. You're sort of mixing that with like Renaissance and medieval era works otherwise doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. It makes more sense to remain pure within one of these two general strains of thought regarding how the occult actually works. Uh, for those who wish to learn more, you can simply Google Egregore and you'll get a great deal of information. Or just go on 4chan's X, um, where you will be told all about secret wizard cults 
and then you'll be laughed at and find a lot of people shit posting. X is a pile of shit. You can go to politically incorrect if you want actual occultism, which is probably the funniest thing on 4chan. You have to go there for the occultism. On X, you're just hearing creepypasta. Very funny to me. That's about all. Peace out.